young electrician suffers an agonizing death. The victim's hair may determine whether it was a job-related poisoning or a deliberate act of murder. The wife and mother-in-law of a police officer die from apparent heart attacks just weeks apart. A paper trail leads to a possible double homicide and a bizarre double life. An engineer with no apparent health problems becomes mysteriously ill and dies. A bounce check triggers a relentless search for the truth. Poison is a silent killer, but not completely undetectable. By utilizing advances in forensic technology, detectives can now expose the perpetrator of an invisible death. September 7, 1991, paramedics were called to the home of Robert and Joanne Curley in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Joanne told emergency technicians that her husband, Robert, was in unbearable pain. Though they could not immediately identify the source of the problem, they found his vital signs were dangerously low. The 32-year-old electrician was rushed to the hospital. Doctors there were already familiar with Robert Curley. They had treated him for a rare nerve disease just a few days earlier. At that time, Curley complained of pain in his hands and feet, as well as hair loss and severe nausea. Now, the escalation of Curley's symptoms caused them to reconsider their diagnosis. The hospital's neurologist quickly ordered new tests, this time for exposure to toxic chemicals. Two weeks later, doctors confirmed that Robert Curley was suffering from exposure to thallium, a toxic heavy metal. Thallium, a naturally occurring element, was widely used in pesticides until the early 1970s, but was banned from widespread use after researchers determined that exposure to concentrated amounts could be deadly. Its use is now restricted to industrial purposes. Forensic toxicologist Dr. Dr. Frederick Readers explains the effects of thallium poisoning. It's a nerve poison, and it starts out very often with burning feet, and then you start getting ascending paralysis, you know, you can't walk and then eventually you can't use your arms, then your eyes start to droop and your neck starts to go and then your brain and your heart and everything goes. So it's a very insidious poison. For Robert Curley, the information came too late. The damage had already been done and the effects were irreversible. After suffering a massive heart attack, he was placed on life support. Soon after, he was declared brain dead. Robert's wife, Joanne, gave permission for her husband's life support to be turned off. A few hours later, Robert Curley was pronounced dead. The official cause of death was cardiopulmonary failure due to thallium poisoning. Now they had to determine how and where he came in contact with the deadly chemical. A representative of OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, was sent to investigate. Joanne Curley stated that prior to his death, Robert had been working on a major renovation on the campus of a local university. That sounds good. Soon after he began the job, Curley complained to co-workers of flu-like symptoms. By the end of the first week, he could barely walk. He said his feet right, felt Bob? like lead. His colleagues noticed that he looked sweaty and red-faced. 
Robert Curley would spend the next month in and out of hospitals, going from one medical crisis to another. The facility where Robert Curley worked housed chemistry labs, as well as rooms where chemicals were stored, including five containers of thallium salts. OSHA investigators began a painstaking examination of the chemistry lab. They needed to identify the source and remove it before others were injured. The team took numerous air samples and exhaustively tested various objects and rooms to determine if there was another source of exposure. They came up empty. There were no signs of tampering or leakage from any of the containers. They learned that Curley was storing cabinets in his garage that he had taken from the university chemistry labs. They searched his home, but found no traces of thallium on the cabinets. With no answers to explain her husband's death, Joanne Curley contacted a toxicologist at the hospital. She seemed terrified that she and her daughter might also have been exposed. She demanded that they be tested for thallium. Joanne Curley tested positive, but the amount of thallium in her system was not at a toxic level. She would not require treatment. Her daughter had even smaller amounts in her system, about 10 times less than her mother. Robert Curley had over 900 times the lethal dose of thallium. Doctors insisted that the high levels of the toxic chemical could not have come through skin absorption. He must have ingested a fatal dose. The hospital passed the test results on to the police. After ruling out suicide, police concluded that the poisoning was no accident. Robert Curley had been murdered. But who would want him dead? Investigators needed to know every aspect of Robert's daily routine. As police collected items from the house, Joanne told detectives that her husband would routinely take a half-gallon thermos filled with iced tea to work with him each day. Any tea left over at the end of the day was shared by the family that night at dinner. The half-gallon container was collected for future analysis. Two other thermoses were also collected, one quart-sized and the other a pint size. Joanne told investigators that neither of these two containers had ever been taken to work by her husband. All of the items collected were sent off to the lab and tested. While waiting for the results, police continued their investigation. They spoke with Robert's fellow employees. There were over 150 tradesmen on the renovation team at the university. Since they all worked at the place where Robert got sick, they were all considered suspects. Police had to determine if any of them had a motive to kill Robert Curley. But no one seemed to dislike the electrician. Robert's co-workers revealed that Joanne had recently come into a large sum of money. She had been awarded over a million dollars in a wrongful death suit after her first husband died in a traffic accident. The financial windfall was a source of friction. Robert wanted to use the money to start his own electrical contracting company. Plus she wanted the yard to be Joanne made it clear no, she had no intention not. of bankrolling her husband's dreams. It's my money. Well, we can talk no, about it. we can't. It's my money, and you're not getting it. Investigators learned that as a result of Robert's death, Joanne stood to collect an additional $300,000 
as the sole beneficiary of several insurance policies. The information was enough for police to put Joanne on the suspect list. But since she and her daughter had also been poisoned, it seemed unlikely that she was the killer. In the lab, examiners tested nearly 100 items taken from the Curley's home. Only two of the items from the Curley home tested positive for thallium. The half-gallon thermos Robert took to work with him each day, and one of the smaller thermoses Joanne insisted never left home. For police, the findings were troublesome. Since thallium was found in a thermos Robert never took to work, there was no direct link between the poisoning and the university. Police began to suspect they had been looking in the wrong place for Robert's killer. The lab results were leaked and published by a local newspaper that was following the investigation. Why don't you just start Joanne told police that she remembered something that would explain why the smaller thermos tested positive. She said that shortly after her husband was hospitalized, he called her and asked that she bring in pizza and iced tea for a farewell party for his roommate. Joanne said she transferred the remaining tea from the half-gallon thermos to the smaller container and took it with her to the hospital. As long as the half-gallon thermos remained the focal point of the investigation, Robert's co-workers could not be dismissed as suspects. And none of them had a reason to kill the electrician. The investigation hit another dead end, one that would last for the next three years. Three years after the poisoning death of Robert Curley, the Pennsylvania State Police took over the investigation. With no leads or suspects, investigators faced a challenge. Sergeant Dave Wondolowski was assigned to the case. The very first step, I, you know, I made a determination that we were going to start right back from scratch, right at the very beginning, and treat this as if the crime had occurred yesterday. Investigators began with the forensic findings. The original autopsy had not determined when and how often the murder victim had ingested thallium. Investigators feared the answers they needed had gone to the grave with Robert Curley. On August 23, 1994, Robert Curley's body was exhumed for examination. Hair and nail samples were taken from the body. Dr. Frederick Readers wanted to establish a timeline using Robert Curley's hair. What you can find out with the hair is when the poison was administered. The hair grows at the rate of about a third of an inch every month. So that you can take a small piece of a hair that's right at the root and you see what's happened just a few days ago. You take it at the tip, in this case it was a 19 centimeter tip, it's basically what happened just about a year earlier. The hair samples were tested using a furnace atomic absorption instrument. In this test, a sample is placed in a graphite tube and heated to the point of vaporization. A light is shined through the tube. The amount of light absorbed by the vapor determines if thallium is present and how much. Robert Curley's hair samples told an especially revealing story. The hair is long enough so that we can say that in November of 1990, he started getting thallium and probably even earlier and that apparently then there was, a, a, you know, he, he got another dose around March of 1991. Another one, a smaller one perhaps, uh, sometime in April. And then he got a whopping dose in June. And then he continued to get doses because instead of going up and down, it just kept going up. Then there was a pause and then we found actually that towards the very end that it was going up like crazy. 
Robert Curley had started ingesting thallium well before he began working at the university. He had been slowly and methodically poisoned to death. Then, a final massive dose had been administered around the time he was last hospitalized. The one person with both motive and access was Joanne Curley. Investigators scoured Joanne's previous statements. Of particular interest was her account of bringing pizza and tea in a pint-sized thermos to Robert and his hospital roommate in the days before Robert's death. Investigators questioned the roommate, Richard Bonin. He gave them a very different story than the one Joanne had given a few years earlier. According to Bonin, neither he nor Robert had asked Joanne to bring them food or drink. Nor were they celebrating Bonin's departure, which did not take place for another two days. That night, according to his roommate, Curly's condition worsened dramatically. He was screaming in pain. Bowman summoned help. He distinctly recalled that Joanne served the iced tea in a large half-gallon thermos. Police believed Joanne had administered the last fatal dose to her husband as doctors tried in vain to save his life. On December 12th, 1996, Joanne Curley was arrested and charged with first degree murder. As part of a plea bargain agreement, Joanne confessed. Only months after she and Robert wed, she realized that the marriage had been a mistake. Divorce was a possibility, but the thought of Robert's life insurance policy tantalized her. An old jar of rat poison she discovered in the basement seemed to be the answer. She could rid herself of her husband and net nearly $300,000 in the bargain. Joanne laced Robert Curley's iced tea each day. To divert suspicion, she administered a harmless dose to her daughter and herself. For a time, her cover-up and frequent diversionary tactics worked. Joanne Curley eluded police for over five years. According to Pennsylvania State Trooper Robert McBride, the forensic findings were invaluable. The forensics gave us a timeline and time periods when people or the murderer would have had to have access to him. And by that means, we were able to exclude other potential suspects. This wasn't really an investigation. Normally, an investigation starts and you zero in on a suspect. This was totally opposite. This was an investigation of exclusion. We went about eliminating people until we got down to one. Joanne Curley was sentenced to serve 10 to 20 years in the Pennsylvania State Penitentiary. Curley poisoned her victim slowly over time. While other killers aren't as methodical, the technique proves just as deadly. In this case, the names of the victims and killer have been changed. On January 30th, 1985, Patrolman Walter Wallace raced to Memorial General Hospital. As a veteran of the Roselle, New Jersey Police Department, he had often responded to medical emergencies. But this call was personal. The doctor informed Wallace that his wife, Beth, had collapsed and suffered a seizure. Wallace was stunned. His wife was fine when he left for work that evening. Beth had no history of seizures, and though she struggled with a weight problem, she had been in relatively good health. As Beth's vital signs rapidly failed, 
doctors could offer the patrolman little hope. She's not taking anything. She's dieting or Nor could they find an explanation for her symptoms. Three hours later, Beth Wallace was dead. Beth and Walter had been married for 24 years and had three children together. Beth's mother, Rose Parker, was living with them when the tragedy occurred. Because of the sudden and mysterious nature of Beth Wallace's death, the doctor requested an autopsy. Cause of death was determined to be cardiac arrest. A month later, tragedy struck the Wallace home again. Rose Parker suffered a massive heart attack. Paramedics worked frantically to stabilize her and swiftly transport her to the hospital. But it was too late. Shortly after her arrival, Rose Parker died. At the Union County Prosecutor's Office, investigators learned of the deaths from Rose Parker's lawyer. The fact that two healthy women had died suddenly and within a month of each other seemed suspicious. He asked investigators to look into Walter Wallace. Assistant Prosecutor Richard Rodbart followed up on this information. Anytime you have a public official, much less a police officer, who is suspected as uh, being the perpetrator of a crime, uh, you have to be uh, extremely sure that the evidence points in that direction before you proceed and before you bring a case against that individual. To rule out foul play, investigators contacted Dr. Reng Lang Lin, chief toxicologist for the state of New Jersey. An examination of the file showed that no toxicology testing had been done. Rose Parker's body, they quickly learned, would yield no clues. There had been no autopsy. She'd been embalmed and buried. But at Beth Wallace's autopsy, tissue samples had been taken. These were sent off for extensive toxicological testing. It would be six weeks before investigators would receive the results. Captain Edward Johnson requested Walter Wallace's personnel file from the Roselle Police Department. From its contents, a portrait of the man emerged. Wallace was an exemplary police officer. He was popular with his superiors and peers. Nothing in the file was out of the ordinary or raised suspicions. Captain Johnson read the file in its entirety, including Wallace's military discharge papers. It showed him to have won several important medals and uh, listed a lot of combat service over in Vietnam. For whatever reason, uh, I can't remember exactly what, what sparked it, but I was looking at it, and I was at first impressed by the record that this fellow had. Then there was something on a 214 that just didn't look right. Johnson contacted the U.S. Army to verify the record. His suspicions were confirmed. He never had any of those medals. He was never in Special Forces. In fact, uh, we, can only, we can't verify overseas service on the part of this man. So the 214 that was in the police department file was a forgery. Walter Wallace was a liar, but was he capable of murder? To find out, Investigators would need to talk with the people who knew him best, his fellow officers. There is a certain difficulty, obviously, in investigating a police officer for, for a crime because you have to go into his department, talk to people that he works with every day, and the more people you talk to, the more you're signaling where your investigation is going. Hi, Jeff. You got that file Investigators for me? made a low-profile visit to the Roselle Police Department while Wallace was off duty. I'll get it back to you in a couple of days, okay? They didn't expect Wallace's colleagues to be forthcoming, but one officer surprised them. According to the officer, 
there was something perplexing about Walter's marital status. He suspected that Walter had married a woman named Jacqueline Deal while he was still married to Beth. Investigators wondered, was Walter legally divorced or living a double life? Through Beth's friends, investigators learned Walter was away from home a lot. He told Beth he was being treated at a VA hospital for exposure to Agent Orange. And that's why sometimes for a week or so he might be gone, or he might be gone for the whole weekend, and she's not going to see or hear from him, and she's not going to be able to get in touch with him because the ward that he's in over at the hospital doesn't have any kind of telephone. He was pretty good, and for a while he was pretty good at juggling all of this. Investigators traveled to nearby Elizabeth, New Jersey, to question Wallace's other wife. Thank you. Well, Jacqueline Deal confirmed that she and Walter had been married on November 2nd, 1984, three months prior to Beth Wallace's death. She said Walter had divorced his wife the summer before. Walter had brought over the divorce papers when it was final, and the two had celebrated. Investigators found the divorce decree among documents provided by Rose Parker's lawyer. Numerous irregularities made them question its validity. Investigators searched for the original divorce decree at the county courthouse. There was no record under the name of Wallace. They then searched under the case number only to discover it belonged to somebody else's divorce. The case name clearly read Martin versus Martin, not Wallace versus Wallace. Police surmised that Wallace used his badge to obtain the Martin's divorce decree. Wallace altered the document in order to obtain a marriage license with Jacqueline. Investigators sent the document to the FBI lab for further analysis. They had caught Walter in another lie. And this one indicated a possible motive for murder. But investigators were perplexed. Why would Wallace fake a divorce and kill his wife rather than legally end the marriage? Looking for a potential financial motive, investigators scrutinized Beth's will. Walter stood to inherit everything, including the family house. But something about this document also caught the investigator's eye. The will was dated just two months prior to Beth's death. The timing seemed too convenient. Further investigation revealed the existence of an earlier will. In this version, Beth had left everything to her mother. She left only one dollar to her husband. Investigators wondered if he had forged the second will and then killed his wife. The new will was notarized by a secretary in the Roselle Police Department. But she denied ever witnessing the will or affixing her seal to the document. The secretary noted that Wallace often worked at her unlocked desk. He could have easily used her notary seal to certify a document without her knowledge. Investigators had built a strong circumstantial case against Walter Wallace, but they needed proof that his paper trail led to murder. Investigators in Roselle, New Jersey, suspected Officer Walter Wallace was responsible for the death of his wife, Beth. Now they hoped to support their circumstantial case with hard proof that Wallace poisoned her. Four months into the case, the New Jersey State Lab reviewed the results of a general toxicological screening of Beth's blood, tissue, and urine. Because the screen only tested for the use of illegal drugs and alcohol, it came up negative. 
laboratory technicians went further, subjecting the samples to a battery of tests to rule out prescription drugs, heavy metals, and a number of ingestible toxins. Still, they found nothing to explain why Beth died. But they had yet to test for one particularly insidious killer, cyanide. Samples from the victim were prepared in test tubes. A color reagent was then added. If cyanide is present, a reaction occurs. Ultimately, the sample turned a dark shade of purple. Beth Wallace had cyanide in her system when she died. To determine the concentration of the poison, the sample was read by a spectrophotometer. A lethal dose of cyanide is about 2.5 milligrams per liter. Results showed that Beth Wallace had nearly twice that much in her blood and more than three times that amount in her spleen. The detective's next move was to tie Walter Wallace to the cyanide. Every detective that we had in the major crimes unit went out there and started banging on doors in the factory district that they have over in Roselle. We went to every, every one of them. It's like, well, do you think they have cyanide or not? Stop and ask. Do you have cyanide? Are you missing any? Did anybody ever come looking for any? Any of it on your hands, make sure you wash your hands because... The canvassing paid off. A clerk at a metal plating factory revealed that Wallace purchased a quantity of potassium cyanide. The officer told him he needed the chemical to raise the serial number on a handgun. On June 18, 1985, Walter Wallace arrived at police headquarters and was asked to report to the chief's office. There, he was placed under arrest and escorted to jail. A warrant was issued to search the Wallace residence. The prosecutor's office enlisted the aid of their narcotics team. Due to the nature of their work, team members are skilled at conducting meticulous searches. James Durkin was a member of that team. Once we got to the house, um, it was somewhat evident why the chief had asked us. The house was um, a littered mess from attic to basement. Um, and that particular day, we had a team up in the attic, as well as the basement, and we were going to meet in the middle. Police removed some 100 items from the Wallace home. A manual typewriter was found hidden behind the couch. Legal documents, including the original Martin divorce decree, were found in a drawer. Upstairs, the narcotics squad found a trap door leading to the attic. Writing samples, along with a page of forged signatures, were collected. Within 15 minutes, a team member discovered a crucial piece of physical evidence. Bingo. An empty bottle. What have you got? Have this in the, attic. the handwritten label read, potassium cyanide. The items were examined in the laboratory, along with the divorce decree and will. A confiscated typewriter was found to have a spacing error consistent with the altered documents. More damaging, signatures on several of the papers were determined to be forged by tracing. Finally, cyanide was found in the bottle recovered from Wallace's attic. The label was in his handwriting. In May 1986, Walter Wallace was found guilty of bigamy and the first degree murder of his wife. Police theorized that Walter Wallace's double life was becoming too complicated 
Instead of filing for divorce, Walter chose murder. But his attempt to finance a new life at his wife's expense was his undoing. Wallace was sentenced to serve from 30 years to life in prison. He was never charged or tried for the murder of his mother-in-law, Rose Parker, due to lack of evidence. The secret life of Walter Wallace was motive for murder. For other killers, the motive is far less complicated. In this case, the names of the victim and killer have been changed. On July 17, 1991, Dana Jacobs awoke to find her husband, Larry, violently ill. This is a little different. It seemed like food poisoning. He had intense stomach pain with vomiting and diarrhea. What's your stomach feel like? When his condition hadn't improved by morning, she decided to take him to the emergency room. She stopped at the neighbors to drop off their children. John Ballier was concerned. Larry had been in and out of the hospital for weeks with gastrointestinal problems. Jacobs was admitted at Humana Suburban Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. Doctors administered intravenous fluids to keep him from dehydrating. There was cause for concern. Although he displayed the classic symptoms of food poisoning, he did not respond to treatment. Hello. The next day, Dana called John Ballier with tragic news. Her husband, Larry, was dead. She asked him not to say anything to the children until she could tell them in person. I think it had an impact on us, just having the kids there, having a good time, oblivious to the fact that their father had died and that their lives were gonna change probably dramatically. An autopsy was performed with Dana's permission. Doctors wanted to know what had killed the otherwise healthy 41-year-old man. Apparently, Jacobs had suffered a massive heart attack. Yet there was no indication of heart disease or what triggered the attack. His sudden death was considered a mystery. On Monday morning, John Ballier related the sad events of the weekend to his colleagues at the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Of course, the, the kids play together. Hey, John, how are you? Shortly afterward, Ballier received intriguing news from a fellow attorney. His brother-in-law owned a chemical company. Dana Jacobs had been a recent customer. How are you? doing today? In fact, she came in the day her husband got sick. She purchased a chemical called colchicine. His brother-in-law only remembered the purchase because Dana's check had bounced. And his brother-in-law had called him, complaining about the fact that this check had bounced. Um, and he thought it was kind of an interesting coincidence that the, the two events involved the same family. Ballier researched the chemical. He found that colchicine in small doses is used to treat gout. Larger amounts could be fatal. He contacted Barbara Weekly Jones, Assistant Chief Medical Examiner for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. There is a fine line between therapeutic levels, meaning giving um, relief from gouty arthritis, and uh, levels of the drug that can cause significant side effects. And the main side effects of this drug are nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea which, um, when it reaches a bad, uh, severe state, can uh, cause death of an individual. Dr. Weekly Jones was aware that the general drug screen performed at autopsy would not reveal a specific toxin, such as colchicine. 
she prepared blood and tissue samples for further testing. She was not optimistic the test results would prove definitive. If Jacobs had ingested colchicine, it had probably been eliminated from his bloodstream prior to his death. Their only hope was to find traces of the chemical in specific organs. Because the gastrointestinal tract absorbs it, uh, it gets partially metabolized in the liver and it gets excreted in the kidney. So those three organs would be the most likely areas to find any residual cochicine at the time of the autopsy. It would take two weeks to obtain the test results. Investigators would have to wait for the answer to a crucial question. Had Larry Jacobs been murdered? Larry Jacobs, a 41-year-old father of two, had died of a mysterious stomach ailment. John Ballier, Jacobs' neighbor and a Commonwealth attorney, was suspicious. He assigned Detective Pat Conkling of the Jefferson County Police Department to investigate. Ballier told Conkling that the dead man's wife had purchased a potentially lethal chemical called colchicine just days before his death. The detective's first order of business was a visit to the state medical examiner's office. The results of Larry Jacobs' toxicology test had finally come in. He had 160 nanograms per milliliter of colchicine in his system. More than enough to kill him. Go ahead and take a seat. It was time to confront Dana Jacobs. Mr. Jacobs, I just have a few questions I'd like to ask you. First, I have to inform you that... But investigators were surprised by the reception they received. She invited us in. There was uh, no hint of any problems. She was very cordial with us. Uh, we never had the uh, first bit of hesitation on her part of talking with us. She readily admitted to buying the colchicine. She said she needed the substance to kill algae growing in her swimming pool. Investigators asked if she still had any left. She said she had used it all in the pool. I asked her how she uh, came across the chemical, and uh, she gave us the name of several businesses that uh, suggested that uh, she use this chemical to control the algae. Detectives contacted these businesses in an effort to confirm Dana's story. No one remembered telling her that colchicine could be used to control algae. In fact, most had never even heard of the substance. Investigators were at an impasse. They knew how Larry Jacobs died, but not why. Perhaps an examination of the couple's marriage would yield more clues. Investigators visited Larry's sister. She told police that the couple was in financial trouble as a result of Dana's compulsive spending. Family members had lent them thousands of dollars, none of which had ever been repaid. Larry told his sister that he had taken steps to keep Dana's spending under control, but to no avail. Their credit cards were at or over their limit. One of Larry's co-workers recalled having to lend him money on a business trip to pay for meals and a hotel room. The embarrassed engineer explained that he had neither cash nor available credit at the time. And there was insurance money. Larry had two life insurance policies on himself, one for $138,000 and the other totaling $250,000. Detectives dug deeper into Dana Jacobs' background. They learned that the respectable wife and mother had a troubled past. 
Before she was married, Dana had served time for bad check charges. From her prison records, investigators learned that a counselor had diagnosed her as a pathological liar who urgently needed psychiatric treatment. Dana Jacobs was arrested and indicted on murder charges in January of 1992. The police were certain they had cornered a killer. But a new clue was about to emerge, a clue that could possibly put her in the clear. Five months after Larry Jacobs' death, his widow Dana was indicted for murder. Out on bail, Dana was back at home with her children. Just weeks before her trial, she made a discovery that could exonerate her. A suicide note from her husband. In it, he said the financial strain was too much to bear. Investigators were skeptical, but the note did appear to be in Larry Jacobs' handwriting. Moreover, it was well known that the deceased had been depressed about money matters. With his background in chemical engineering, it was possible he was familiar with colchicine and used it to end his life. The suicide note was forwarded to Stephen Slater, the Commonwealth's document expert. The first thing he noticed was that different pens had been used. You'd have a paragraph or a sentence or two that's a fairly thin line, uh, small point writing instrument, and then it would shift to uh, a medium or a broad instrument for another word or two or three, and back again. It quickly became apparent that the note had been created by cutting and pasting words and phrases from Larry Jacobs' writings. After it was pasted up, uh, the close examination of the note showed that it had first been copied by passing it through a fax machine to produce a copy. In the five and a half months following her husband's death, Dana Jacobs spent close to $200,000 half of the insurance money she'd collected. One of her first purchases had been a fax machine. The suicide note she doctored represented a last desperate gamble to throw authorities off her trail. Another piece of damning evidence was provided by John Ballier's daughter. I know how she did it. Oh, that's not something she'd no. say. Dad, I really do. I know how she did it. Sarah Ballier testified that she saw Dana Jacobs filling oh, clear no. gel caps with Mama, white powder. Sure. Mrs. Jacobs told the girl what that she was making vitamins perfect? to put into her husband's food. Well, can we go? She explained it was the only way she could get him to take his vitamins. Police theorized that Dana Jacobs used a familiar household routine to poison her unsuspecting husband. On November 23, 1992, Dana Jacobs was convicted of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Lethal but invisible, poison has historically enabled killers to strike without fear of reprisal but unseen no longer means undetected. Thanks to advances in forensic science, detectives have new tools to catch the killer and unravel the mystery behind an invisible death. I'll just look over here, detect the operation. A serial killer in Texas goes undetected for 11 years. Yeah, but, um... Police identify a suspect but their case must be pulled from the trash. Investigators hope new forensic techniques can establish a link among the murders and put an end to the violent rampage. In California, 
a missing persons case leads detectives to a secret burial ground at a Sacramento boarding house. An unlikely suspect becomes the focus of a mass murder investigation. Can science help unmask the murderer hiding behind a kindly face? Homicide investigators find that things aren't always what they appear to be. Seemingly insignificant clues may expose a pattern and put police on the trail of a killer whose compulsion is to kill again. December 21st, 1984, in Wichita Falls, Texas, Lisa Boone returned home from her job at a local hospital and found herself locked out. Lisa asked her landlady to unlock the apartment. She'd given her keys to Terry Sims, a friend and co-worker who was spending the night. But Terry wasn't answering the door. Inside, the women found the apartment had been ransacked. Lisa called out to Terry, but got no response. Terry, I didn't hear. The landlady noticed blood on the floor and followed the trail. It led to Terry Sims' body. Officers from the Wichita Falls Police Department responded to the scene. Upstairs, they found the 20-year-old victim dead on the bathroom floor. She was nude, except for socks. Her hands had been tied behind her back. Police processed the scene, looking for any clue that might identify the killer. They collected blood samples, a pair of white tennis shoes with the laces still tied, and a woman's hospital uniform. They also recovered a blood-stained bedspread and sheets. At the police station, Lisa told detectives that she and Terry Sims left the hospital together after working the 3 to 11 shift. She explained that she was also a part-time student at Midwestern State University and had an exam the next day. Terry was going to stay the night at Lisa's apartment to help her study in the morning. But Lisa said the hospital was short-staffed that night, so she volunteered for an extra shift. She dropped her friend off at the apartment around 12.30, gave Terry her keys, and returned to work. When was the last time you saw her? Lisa told police she'd arrived back home around 7 a.m. and knocked on the door. She had no idea who could have murdered her friend. An autopsy was performed on Terry Sims, and cause of death was determined to be multiple stab wounds to the chest and back. While there was no sign of forcible rape, biological evidence was collected from the victim's body. Excuse me, detective. Most murder victims know their killers, so Wichita Falls police began interviewing Terry Sims' family and friends. They quickly focused on her ex-boyfriend. He denied involvement. Investigators had little evidence against him, but they had a new forensic tool in their arsenal. In 1984, DNA profiling was in its infancy and held the potential to link a killer to his crime through biological evidence left at the scene but large amounts of evidence were needed to successfully perform the tests. 
Hoping samples recovered in Terry Sims' case might identify her murderer, police submitted them to the Gene Screen Lab in Dallas. But their hopes were soon dashed. There wasn't enough material for DNA testing. With no hard evidence linking a suspect to the murder, the investigation stalled, and the case remained unsolved. On February 15, 1985, two months after Terry Sims was found murdered, an electric company employee was working on a transformer just outside the Wichita Falls city limits. He made a horrifying discovery. He stumbled upon a woman's body. He called 911. Deputies from the Archer County Sheriff's Department arrived at the scene. In the woods, they found the victim. Nearby, they recovered a leather jacket, a blood-stained nurse's uniform, and a pair of sneakers with the laces still tied. A search of police databases turned up a missing person fitting the victim's description. An autopsy confirmed her identity as Tony Gibbs, a 23-year-old nurse from Wichita Falls, reported missing by her brother a month earlier. The pathologist determined that she died from stab wounds to the chest and abdomen. Biological evidence was collected from the victim's body. Archer County investigators developed several suspects. They soon focused on a man named Danny Wayne Laughlin. He was the last person seen with Tony Gibbs. He had also been held on suspicion of rape in Kansas City, Missouri, less than a year before. Laughlin denied killing Tony Gibbs, but three separate polygraph tests suggested deception. At investigators' request, he provided blood and hair samples for DNA testing. Though the results were inconclusive, police believed they had the right man. Laughlin stood trial for the murder of Tony Gibbs. The jury was unable to reach a verdict. A mistrial was declared. Laughlin was never tried again. The Gibbs case remained open. On October 10, 1985, a maintenance worker was cutting grass alongside a road in Wichita County. In the overgrowth, he discovered a woman's body. He called the Wichita County Sheriff's Department. When deputies responded, they found the body of a woman, nude except for one sock. There were no clues as to the victim's identity. Police searched the surrounding area and found her clothing nearby. They also recovered a pair of sneakers with the laces tied. An autopsy was performed, but advanced decomposition made it difficult to determine how the woman died. Based on available evidence, however, the medical examiner concluded the cause of death to be undetermined homicidal violence. Wichita County Sheriff's deputies determined that the victim fit the description of a woman reported missing a month earlier. She was identified as 21-year-old Ellen Blau. They interviewed two suspects who had been with her the night she was last seen. But deputies had insufficient evidence to charge them. After several months, the case remained unsolved. 
While the three cases were investigated by different law enforcement agencies, they all fell under the jurisdiction of the Wichita County District Attorney's Office. Barry Maka had recently been elected district attorney and took over just days after Terry Sims' murder. The unsolved murders haunted him. The absolute terror that they went through in the final minutes of their lives motivated me to find the person responsible for their deaths. But investigators in each of the cases had exhausted all their leads, and there was nothing more Maka could do. More than a decade would pass before there was a break in the unsolved murders. By 1996, more than 11 years had passed since the murders of Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau in Texas. Police still had no viable suspects in any of the murders. But improved forensic procedures prompted the Wichita County District Attorney to request a re-examination of the evidence from two of the three murders. Some of the evidence was sent to Glenn Unash, a latent print examiner at the Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Lab in Austin. He found a partial print on a sneaker recovered from the Terry Sims murder scene that had gone undetected. It didn't belong to Terry Sims. However, there was insufficient detail to make a comprehensive analysis. Because blood will darken as it absorbs the light, Unash hoped more ridge characteristics would emerge under laser light. He was disappointed. There was one more option, a dye staining technique. But there was a risk involved. The dye staining technique could possibly destroy what is there, so uh, the print was photographed prior to that. Once I got that photograph back, I examined it to make sure it re I recorded all the characteristics. Unash was now ready to try the dye staining process. He saturated the print with amino black, which reacts to proteins in blood and turns them dark blue or black. But the process didn't develop any further ridge detail. The evidence enhancement he had hoped for eluded him. Over the next three years, he examined a series of suspect prints provided by the Wichita County District Attorney's Office and compared them to the one found on Terry Sims' sneaker. I did not identify any of the suspects that they had sent me. I uh, reported to them that uh, the print appears to be partial second, third joint or another area of the palm. They started sending me in some palm prints. I made those comparisons. I still did not identify the print. At the same time, DNA testing of the biological samples from the Sims and Gibbs cases was again underway at Gene Screen in Dallas. A new technology, PCR analysis, could provide forensic scientist Judy Floyd with more conclusive results than previous tests. The requirements were not as stringent, and therefore we were able to use this very old, very degraded DNA and uh, obtain a genetic profile of the perpetrator. The new DNA process eliminated all previous suspects, including Danny Wayne Laughlin, who had stood trial for the murder of Tony Gibbs a decade earlier. But it did turn up a startling piece of evidence. Biological samples recovered from both victims came from the same individual. Emerging technology and improved forensics had linked two apparently unrelated cases. Now there was evidence a serial killer had claimed the lives of Terry Sims and Tony Gibbs. District Attorney Barry Maka wondered if some of the other unsolved cases were related. He began taking a closer look at those files. One caught his attention, that of Ellen Blau. Maka noted that circumstances of her murder were similar to the Sims and Gibbs homicides down to the sneakers, laces still tied, 
found by her nude body. On January 12, 1999, Maka asked his investigator, John Little, to review the three cases and try to develop a suspect. He also gave Little a possible lead. Though the victims had been discovered in three different police jurisdictions, they all lived within a relatively small geographical area. Because of the close proximity, I felt that the person responsible for their deaths had some connection to that neighborhood. And so I emphasized that to John and asked him to review the files and, and see if he could establish anyone with a connection um, to the neighborhood that may be involved in, in the cases. Little began by probing for common threads among the women. It didn't take him long to find them. He noticed that they all shared several physical characteristics. All the victims were around the same age, pretty much the same build. They're, they were all around five foot tall, not much taller. They all weighed 120 pounds or less. They all seemed to have pretty much the same features. A distinct pattern was emerging, suggesting all three women had been killed by the same person. Then he found a name in the Ellen Blau file, a man named Farian Wardrip. While in custody on a murder charge back in 1986, Wardrip had told police that he knew Blau. It meant nothing to the police at the time, Little wondered if it meant anything now. He learned Wardrip had worked as an orderly at the same hospital as Tony Gibbs. And records showed that he had left that job four days after the first victim, Terry Sims, was found murdered. As investigators dug deeper, they uncovered more connections between Wardrip and the three women. He had lived in an apartment downstairs from Ellen Blau. That apartment was two blocks from the residence where Terry Sims was murdered. When Ellen Blau was murdered, Wardrip no longer lived at her apartment complex. He had moved to a residence across the street from the sub shop where she worked. Authorities had placed Wardrip in the neighborhood and established links between him and the victims. They were a long way from proving murder, but now they felt they were finally on the right track. A background check confirmed that Wardrip was a convicted murderer. He had confessed to killing a Wichita Falls woman in 1986. According to the records, he'd fled to Galveston, but turned himself in to police there. Sentenced to 35 years in prison, Wardrip had been paroled in 1997. During the 11 years he was incarcerated, there were no murders in Wichita Falls that were similar to those of Sims, Gibbs, or Blau. And I felt like he was a very strong suspect, but the only way to find out for sure if he was the one responsible for these murders or not, was to obtain a DNA sample. Although circumstantial evidence pointed to Wardrip, it wasn't enough to obtain a court order to force him to provide DNA samples. Maka and Little decided to try to collect them surreptitiously. Their plan would require surveillance. Investigators contacted Wardrip's parole officer for information. So where's he going? They learned that Wardrip lived in nearby Olney, Texas, where he taught Sunday school and worked at a window screen company. According to the parole officer, Wardrip was being electronically monitored and was restricted to his apartment complex unless he was at work or church. Appreciate it. Take care. And that posed problems for investigators. For three days, they watched Wardrip at work behind a locked chain link fence. He seemed to be beyond their reach. 
but on the fourth day, they got a break. On February 5th, 1999, the fence was unlocked and Wardrip was outside. He was with his wife, eating crackers and drinking coffee from a disposable cup. When he tossed the cup into a trash can just inside the gate, it was the opportunity they had been waiting for. The undercover investigator approached Wardrip and asked if he could get a tobacco spit cup. Wardrip told him to help himself. With that, any evidence obtained by investigators would be admissible in a court of law. He retrieved Wardrip's cup. Investigators hoped they now had their DNA sample. But would a few drops of coffee and cracker crumbs be enough to prove murder? More than a dozen years had passed since the murders of Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau in Wichita Falls, Texas. Investigators had finally gathered physical evidence they hoped would prove Ferry and Wardrip was the killer. Now it was up to Gene Screen Lab in Dallas. Judy Floyd carefully swabbed the lip of the cup to collect Wardrip's saliva. When she compared that to DNA samples retrieved from the Sims and Gibbs murders, she was able to establish a match. And there was more. She discovered that Wardrip's profile was unique. He had not one, but four very rare markers in his genetic profile. His uh, profile was so rare that you would expect it to occur only one time in several thousand times the population of the Earth. And in effect, we were able to say that we have established identity with this particular individual to the evidence involved in Miss Sims and Miss Gibbs' case. Investigators didn't stop there. At the Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Lab, Glenn Unash compared Wardrip's fingerprints to the partial print found on Terry Sims' sneaker. They matched. Besides making a positive identification, Unash could explain much more. I can also determine how that shoe was held or uh, when that print was left on that shoe. And it was in a uh, direction that the uh, defendant held the shoe or uh, was taking the shoe off the victim's foot, somewhat similar to this, which would be consistent with pulling it off of a victim's foot. Investigators' patience and ingenuity had paid off. It was time to take Wardrip into custody. They again enlisted the cooperation of his parole officer. On the pretense of a meeting, Wardrip was summoned to the parole office on February 13, 1999. When he arrived, police arrested Ferry and Wardrip and charged him with the murder of Terry Sims. Based on the evidence, police believe Wardrip saw Terry Sims at the door of Lisa Boone's apartment. After forcing his way inside, he tied her hands behind her back, then raped and killed her. Ferry and Wardrip pled guilty to the capital murders of Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau. He was sentenced to death in the Sims case and received life terms in each of the others. Wardrip also confessed to an additional murder. In all, he had ended the lives of five young women. In Texas, a serial killer's guilt was contained in a disposable coffee cup. But on the West Coast, police would have to dig deeper for proof of murder. On November 7, 1988, in Sacramento, California, 
social worker Judy Moyes contacted Sacramento police about one of her clients, 52-year-old Bert Montoya. She said Bert had disappeared from the boarding house where she'd placed him. His landlady seemed unsure about his whereabouts. Ms. Moyes told police that Dorothea Puente's boarding house was a refuge for indigent people, many with histories of alcohol and drug abuse. It seemed ideal for Bert, a street person with no place to go. He had his own room and TV and was happy there after years of living on the streets. But after a few months, Bert started saying he wanted to leave. Judy Moyes hadn't heard from Bert in three months. Mrs. Puente finally explained that Bert had gone to live with his brother in Utah. That made no sense to Judy Moyes. She knew Bert Montoya didn't have any family. She asked police to look into it. Officers went to interview Dorothea Puente. She seemed a gracious, grandmotherly woman, charming and eager to cooperate. She said Bert had gone to live with family in Utah. One of the residents in the boarding house corroborated the account. I know who he is. But as the officer was leaving, the resident slipped him a note. He wanted to talk. He told police that he'd seen some strange things at the house. Bert wasn't the only one who vanished. Another tenant, Ben Fink, had two. And there were others. But their social security checks kept coming. He also described a terrible odor around the boarding house. He said he'd once worked at a mortuary and recognized the smell of death. Where, whereabouts are these holes? The police officer filed a missing persons report on Bert Montoya. Detective John Cabrera of the Sacramento Police Department was assigned the case. The name Dorothea Puente was familiar to him. She was known as a champion of the dispossessed. She was highly respected for all of her charitable things that she had done to the Hispanic community. Um, there were people that visited from other countries who came here to praise her and talk to her. And uh, she was known in the Hispanic community as Doctora, which is Spanish for doctor. Now, Detective Cabrera requested a background check on Dorothea Puente. Based on her reputation, it wasn't what he expected. He learned that the kindly grandmother was actually only 59 years old and had a criminal history of preying on the elderly. She'd been previously convicted on multiple counts of forging Social Security checks and had served four years in prison. For investigators, her M.O. was surprising. And she was getting these checks by putting knockout drops in these individuals' drinks. And of course, when they passed out, she took their check and signed it. Conditions of Dorothea Puente's parole prohibited her from keeping a boarding house. That gave detectives a reason to look deeper into the situation. Four days after Bert Montoya was reported missing, they met with Judy Moyes, hoping she could provide more information about the boarding house. She said most of the residents were poor, the forgotten elderly who exist on the fringes of society. But Dorothea Puente always had a place for them. And she had a reputation for treating tenants like family. Moyes claimed that several other social workers began to notice that their clients sometimes disappeared from the house, never to be seen again. Bert Montoya was the most recent.
perhaps some of the tenants had simply wandered off or family members had decided to take care of them. Investigators decided to find out. Later that morning, police met with Dorothy Puente. Although they didn't have a warrant, she graciously gave them permission to conduct a search. In one of the upstairs bedrooms, police found prescription medication, a sedative in the name of Dorothy Miller. She was related Mrs. To Puente me. told them it belonged to a relative who had stayed with her for a while. Investigators asked if they could dig around in her backyard. Mrs. Puente not only gave them permission, she offered to get people in to dig for them. That didn't seem the action of a person with something to hide. Investigators declined her offer and began digging themselves. After finding nothing in three holes, they began to think they were wasting their time. But in the fourth, they found corrosive lime, often used to mask odors and speed decay. They decided to keep digging. To their surprise, they uncovered what appeared to be a human leg bone. At a boarding house for the elderly run by 59-year-old Dorothea Puente, Sacramento police uncovered human remains. We need to get uh, forensics here. Yeah. The coroner's office and a crime scene unit were dispatched to the scene. Puente agreed to accompany police to the station to make a statement. She was very cooperative and appeared genuinely shocked that bones were found in her yard. She said she had been living there for little more than a year. Perhaps the previous owner could explain the bones. But Puente's criminal past could not be ignored. Police asked her outright if she'd killed her missing tenant, 52-year-old Bert Montoya. Dorothea Puente calmly denied it. Since there was no evidence of any crime, investigators took Mrs. Puente home. The next morning, the search at the boarding house continued. As more police and excavation equipment arrived, curious onlookers and reporters began to assemble outside the house. Around 9.45, Mrs. Puente asked if she was free to go to the corner coffee shop. Since she'd been so cooperative and detectives had no proof of her involvement in any foul play, they let her go. Fifteen minutes later, at 10 a.m., forensic technicians uncovered a second body, wrapped in a tarp, buried under a cement slab. The condition of the tarp indicated that this body hadn't been underground very long. A police officer was dispatched to pick up Dorothy Puente at the coffee shop. She wasn't there. We sent people over there to find out who had seen her, if anybody had talked to her, uh, what was going on. They went over there and they had ascertained that she had uh, got into a taxi cab and drove off. Sacramento police traced the cab and learned it had taken her to the Stockton bus station, 50 miles away. There, they learned she boarded a bus to Los Angeles. Not knowing where she might be heading, investigators launched a nationwide search for Dorothy Puente. She was now wanted on suspicion of murder. At the boarding house, authorities continued digging. Their search for missing person Bert Montoya had unearthed human remains of one victim and a second buried corpse. Mindful of statements that several residents had disappeared, police feared Mrs. Puente's yard might conceal more ugly secrets. <laughs> 
The second body had been discovered under a cement slab that seemed out of place. Now they realized that several more sheds, slabs, and planters were oddly situated. They soon discovered the reason for that. Laura Santos, deputy coroner of Sacramento County, supervised the search. Under every one of these odd seeming things like the sink, there was a body. Under the poorly poured piece of concrete, there was a body. Next to the shed that looked hastily assembled, there was a body. After three days, the dig finally came to an end. Seven bodies had been uncovered in Dorothea Puente's yard. Police were dealing with a mass murderer. It seemed impossible that seven people could have been buried right under the neighbors' noses without anyone seeing anything. Hoping for information or witnesses, detectives began interviewing Mrs. Puente's neighbors. It was hard to find anyone with anything negative to say about her. It was like fighting an uphill battle. The community, first of all, did not want to accept the fact that this gray-haired little woman who they loved so much and who had given so much to the community was responsible for this gruesome task of uh, putting these people in the yard. While investigators canvassed the neighborhood, the grim task of identifying the seven victims, three men and four women, was underway at the Sacramento coroner's office. All the bodies were x-rayed, then forensic pathologists performed autopsies on them. The coroner started with the victim most closely matching Bert Montoya's description. She began by carefully removing layers of wrapping and documenting each. The body, like many of the others, was wrapped in a signature way that suggested a methodical but twisted mind. Sheets wrapped with duct tape, then quilts stitched together, blankets, then more sheets, more um, tarps. I remember there were blue tarps on a couple of the cases. And then each layer would somehow be secured, either with twine or duct tape or actually stitched with thread. And then the entire bundle, perhaps, duct taped together. The wrappings concealed advanced decomposition, which made it impossible to establish a cause of death for any of the victims. But because of the circumstances, all were ruled homicide. The condition of the bodies also prevented pathologists from immediately identifying any of the victims. As Dr. Santos explains. Most people are identified by fingerprints first, next by dental records, and then by other means. Four out of the seven bodies were too decomposed to get decent fingerprints from. None of them had any teeth. So the usual methods that we make an identification could not be used. The tissue samples were sent to forensic labs for further analysis. To aid in identification efforts, investigators tried to locate people who had disappeared from the boarding house. They found the brother of 55-year-old Ben Fink, one of the tenants believed to be missing. But he told police he hadn't heard from Ben in three months. Investigators feared Ben Fink had already been found. To build their murder case against 59-year-old Dorothea Puente, police needed physical proof linking her to the victim's deaths. Investigators went through the boarding house again. They found twine, duct tape, and a coffee can with the word lie written on it. Police found dozens of bottles of the prescribed sedative Dalmain. That didn't seem unusual in a boarding house full of elderly people. But investigators noticed all of the Dalmain, although prescribed by several different doctors, was in Dorothea Puente's name. As details of the investigation became public, 
police began hearing from witnesses who helped them reconstruct an account of Dorothy Puente's daily routine. It seemed she had a penchant for pre-dawn gardening and became very angry if interrupted. They also learned that she insisted on personally collecting the mail every day, particularly at the end of the month. She was always there to get the mail because, of course, the mail had the checks. And um, she would take the checks and keep control of all the money. Investigators learned that nobody had questioned that control. Since most of the boarding house residents had drug or alcohol problems, it seemed a logical way to keep them from lapsing into their old habits. Police believed that by persuading residents to sign their monthly checks over to her, Mrs. Puente would be assured that the money would keep coming even after the tenants disappeared. In fact, she was getting 10 to 12 federal assistance checks each month, some for people who hadn't lived at the boarding house in years. Bank, Police believed that, uh, money was the motive for murder, but they still needed to find their suspect. Despite the manhunt, Dorothy Puente was still at large. On November 16th, less than a week after she fled, investigators got a tip that Dorothy Puente was at a motel in Los Angeles. An elderly man called police when he saw her picture on TV. He'd recognized her as the woman who'd struck up a conversation about his social security benefits. She wanted to know things like, you know, how much he was getting and was he taking, you know, a benefit, full benefit of receiving the money. And of course, you know, he was inquisitive, but she had told him that she knew how to raise his money allotment. Even as a fugitive, she couldn't resist the opportunity to cash in. Her greed had finally caught up with her. Dorothy Puente was finally in custody. Though they believed they knew her motive for the murders, police had no physical evidence linking her to them. In addition, the victims' identities were still unknown. A latent print examiner was brought in. He compared known samples to fingerprints from three of the bodies. He confirmed that one of the victims was Bert Montoya. He would soon identify Ben Fink and Dorothy Miller as well. Science had made a liar of Dorothy Puente. But there remained four victims without names. Police had compiled a list of 60 people who had received Social Security checks at Dorothy Puente's boarding house. They tried to track down every name on that list. They found most of the people still alive, having moved out of the house for a variety of reasons. But a few were still unaccounted for. They then assembled medical records on each missing person. The files were forwarded to the Sacramento coroner's office. There, forensic pathologists began the painstaking task of comparing x-rays of each body found in the yard to medical records from each of the missing persons. They looked for distinguishing characteristics in the records that could be linked to each victim. We did find anomalies in the bodies, abnormalities, like one person had had skull surgery and had evidence that he'd had a craniotomy. And another person had irregular characteristics of one of her clavicles, and she'd also had some mandible lower jaw fractures in the past. And using that information from the bodies, we were then able to start making comparisons with the medical records we'd obtained from this list that Social Security had provided us. The victims had all finally been identified. But police were still missing a crucial piece of the puzzle, how they died. Until that question could be answered, authorities would have a hard time proving murder 
they hoped a forensic toxicologist could give them answers. In November of 1988, police investigating the murders of seven people at a Sacramento boarding house enlisted the aid of toxicologist William Phillips at the California Department of Justice. With no obvious cause of death, they hoped he would be able to determine whether drugs or poisons had ended the victims' lives. Phillips began by analyzing all seven victims' tissue samples with a radioamino acid, or RIA, test, which is sensitive to classes of drugs. The test results showed all of the samples contained the sedative flurazepam, which is used widely in Dalmain, the drug found at Dorothea Puente's boarding house. It is a potent sedative often prescribed for the elderly. It was the first physical evidence linking Puente to the deaths of the seven victims. Next, Phillips subjected the samples to the tandem mass spectrometer, the only one on the west coast at the time. The apparatus uses negative ion detection to find the characteristic profile or footprint of individual drugs. Besides detecting the presence of fluorazepam or dalmain in each sample, it also measured the drug's concentration. But because the bodies had been underground for varying periods of time, those concentrations did not necessarily reflect levels present at the time of death. Some of the drug could have seeped into the ground. The drug dalmain was present in all the samples but the concentrations were so varied that no one could say whether or not the drug caused their death. But I was able to link all the samples, all the tissues, the brains, the liver tissues from all these victims to Dorothea Puente. Investigators believed they had enough evidence to charge Dorothea Puente with the murder of her seven tenants. Based on the evidence, police believe she would charm residents into giving her control of their money. If they were reluctant, she would invite them into her private rooms and give them a drink laced with drugs. Afterwards, she would methodically wrap the bodies and hire men to dig holes in her backyard. During her pre-dawn gardening, the 59-year-old woman managed to bury her victims. On August 15, 1993, Dorothea Puente was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. The jury was unable to reach verdicts on the other four charges. She was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Serial killers are methodical, skilled at covering their tracks in order to keep killing. But even the cleverest of predators cannot avoid detection for long. Today, forensic scientists using sophisticated technology are helping police stop deadly criminals with an urge to kill again. Police investigating the disappearance of a woman in Iowa close in on a suspect. But to prove murder, they must identify a severed torso pulled from the Mississippi River. In Ohio, a grave is unearthed at a construction site. A makeshift coffin and human bones are all investigators have to lead them to a killer. An Illinois state trooper makes a gruesome discovery on the side of the road. Investigators must make their case from the unknown victim's teeth. Some killers believe that they have left no trace of themselves or their victims behind. <laughs> 
but forensic scientists have found ways to decipher a killer's calling card by reading clues written in bone. Located on a bend on the Mississippi River, Davenport, Iowa is known as a quiet fishing community. But on March 18, 1983, police were visited by a concerned citizen named Marianne Roth. Marianne was worried about her friend, Joyce Clint. They had spoken on the phone earlier in the morning and had made plans to spend the afternoon together. But Joyce hadn't shown up. Joyce had been under a lot of stress in recent weeks. Her marriage was in bad shape, and she and her husband, Jim, were considering divorce. I don't think so. Marianne described Joyce as a dedicated mother, not the type to simply run off without a word. For the sake of their son, Bart, Joyce had tried to keep the marriage together but she wasn't naive. Marianne turned over a tape that Joyce had made several days before her disappearance. Joyce had planned to use it as evidence if the divorce went to trial. When investigators played the tape, they quickly realized that Joyce had secretly recorded an incriminating conversation between her and Jim. On it, she confronted her husband about money he was allegedly skimming from his chiropractic business. Responding to the threats, Jim told Joyce that if she exposed him, he would put her head under the pillow, smother her, and then cut her up into little pieces. Though it was savage talk, police are used to hearing these kinds of violent threats from couples facing divorce. To investigators, it was more likely that Joyce had decided to leave town. With the tape safe at Marianne's, she could slip away until the divorce case went to trial. That theory was supported the following day. Joyce's friends discovered her car parked near the airport. Inside the vehicle, police found no evidence of a struggle or any signs of foul play. For investigators, everything suggested that Joyce had gone missing on purpose. Corporal Jerry McCabe of the Davenport Police Department worked the investigation. It first looked like a possible family argument where she may have taken off and hadn't uh, spoken to anybody in a while. But the persistence of Joyce Clint's friends convinced police to look into the disappearance. They paid a visit to Jim Clint. Jim readily admitted that he and Joyce had fought on the morning of the 18th. He had stormed out and gone to the marina where he kept his boat in order to cool off. Because of rising floodwaters, he decided not to go out on the river. He secured his boat and returned home. By that time, he said Joyce was gone, along with a closet full of clothes and $4,000 of his money. Investigators checked on his alibi with a visit to the marina. Did you see him on uh, March 18th? A restaurant manager confirmed that she saw Clint that morning, around 11 a.m. She saw Clint loading filled trash bags onto his boat. She said he left the dock in his boat, returned sometime later, and then went out again. 
This eyewitness account contradicted Jim's alibi. Detectives decided to take a closer look into Jim Clint's background. Jim Clint's drinking and philandering were well known in the small community of Davenport. Police learned that he had been having a blatant affair with one of his patients. Hoping to learn more, investigators tracked the woman down. She told investigators that on the day of Joyce's disappearance, Jim had invited her over around noon. He had a surprise. He said that Joyce agreed to a divorce and had left town. Now they could finally be together. Joyce's threats to expose Jim's alleged embezzling, coupled with the information about his extramarital affair, gave investigators reason to believe that Jim Clint had motive to kill his wife. But without any hard evidence that a crime had been committed, it was still just speculation. But on April 15th, nearly a month after Joyce's disappearance, the Mississippi River would offer a gruesome clue. Several miles south of Davenport, two fishermen noticed something floating in the river. As they got closer, they could see that it was the remains of something human. They fled the scene and called 911. Investigators responded to the riverbank and pulled the body from the water. It was a female torso, severed just above the navel and just below the tops of the thighs. For even the most seasoned detectives, the scene was difficult to comprehend. A limited autopsy determined that the victim was a Caucasian woman who'd been in the water anywhere from two weeks to four months. The cut marks appeared to have been made by a chainsaw with a 5 16 of an inch chain. Mindful of the violent threats Jim had made on the tape, investigators believe they had found Joyce Clint. But they were a long way from proving murder. To make their case, they would first have to identify the remains. And that wouldn't be easy. Investigators turned to renowned forensic anthropologist Clyde Snow at the University of Oklahoma. His approach is simple. And basically what we try to do is look at the skeleton, all 200 bones and, and uh, 32 teeth, uh, and we're trying to answer two questions primarily. Who is this person? Who was this person? And how did they die? Snow's expertise allows him to develop a profile from the barest of bones. Even with only the torso to work with, Snow could tell a lot about the victim. To determine her age, he studied the area of the pelvis known as the pubic synthesis. The surfaces of this, this joint undergo some fairly regular changes with age. In younger people, there's a, a, a system of strong grooves, you might say, and ridges. They gradually begin to disappear in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, so on, till finally you wind up with a rather flat, featureless surface. Based on the ridge detail in the victim's pelvis, Snow believed the victim was between 26 and 34 years old. Next, he studied the dimensions of the remaining leg and hip bones and calculated that she was between 5 feet and 5 feet 6 inches tall 
and weighed between 125 and 140 pounds. Even though Joyce Clint fit those measurements, police soon learned that so did dozens of other missing women. Until investigators could narrow down their pool of possible victims, the identity of the severed torso would remain a mystery. Police in Davenport, Iowa struggled with two cases, the disappearance of Joyce Clint and the discovery of a severed torso pulled from the Mississippi River. They believed the cases were connected and they believed Joyce's husband, Jim, was responsible. But until they could positively identify the remains, they couldn't prove murder. Using the description of the victim supplied by forensic anthropologist Dr. Clyde Snow, Davenport Police Lieutenant Dennis Kern began a computerized search of all missing women in the region. The computer returned the names of 17 missing women. Detectives were able to eliminate eight of the women since they had disappeared after the torso was found. Two of the women were ultimately found and another three didn't match the physical description. When we were finished, we were finished with four people, one of whom was Joyce Clint. With the investigation taking on a more narrow focus, investigators decided to pay another visit to Jim Clint. They returned to his home, this time with a search warrant. In his garage, they found what they were looking for. A chainsaw with a 5 16 of an inch chain the same width as the cut marks on the body. Technicians processed the chainsaw with indicator fluid that turns pink in the presence of blood. They covered every square inch of the saw. Not a single drop of blood or tissue could be found. Either Jim Clint was smarter than investigators had imagined, or the torso found in the river was not Joyce Clint. There was only one way to be sure. Police had to find a way to positively identify the remains. Though DNA analysis hadn't yet been developed in 1983, there were new ways of identifying an individual from genetic markers in blood enzymes. Blood samples were subpoenaed from Jim Clint and his son, Bart. A comparison with the blood from the victim showed a genetic consistency with Bart. Further tests of Joyce Clint's parents' blood also showed consistent patterns. The genetic information on its own was not enough to establish identity. But out of the four unaccounted for women, only Joyce Clint matched both the physical description as described by Dr. Snow and the genetic description provided by the blood tests. The conclusion was unmistakable. Looking at the women that met these physical characteristics, what of those four, what were the odds that any one of them would have matched the genetic picture? And uh, the odds were infinitesimal. The torso belonged to Joyce Clint. And all of the evidence pointed to her husband, Jim, as the killer. There's a division of monies, uh, properties, and that he was going to lose. He was going to have a lot of things taken away from him because she was uh, done, fed up, ready to go. And the girlfriend motive was there. Uh, there were so many that he thought that uh, were in his way of a happier life. <laughs> 
Jim was arrested and charged with the murder of his wife. Police believe that Jim executed his plan on the morning of March 18th. After murdering Joyce in their home, he drove her remains to a remote spot where he dismembered her with a chainsaw. He used his boat to dispose of the body parts and the saw. He then placed her car near the airport to throw investigators off his trail. Though he maintained his innocence through the trial, the jury found Jim Clint guilty of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Jim Clint thought that dismemberment would keep himself and his victim from ever being identified. In Ohio, a killer tried to avoid prosecution by keeping his horrible secret buried deep in the ground. On June 20th, 1990, in the small northern Ohio town of Illyria, a construction worker uncovered a long-buried secret. His bulldozer struck a hard object, resting several feet beneath the ground. It appeared to be a wooden box. As he walked closer to the find, he was overwhelmed by a horrible odor. He realized he had unearthed a makeshift grave. He called police. Lieutenant Dan Jekyll of the Illyria Police Department was immediately dispatched to the site. Due to the construction, the scene had already been compromised. But we were concerned about the evidence. The evidence was being pushed down by the bulldozer. There are bits of pieces and wood that might have been carried 25, 30, 40 yards away besides the initial scene that we had to protect. That wasn't their only problem. Rain clouds threatened to destroy possible trace evidence. With the site now exposed, they would only have this one chance to get what they needed. To preserve any potential findings, investigators had to treat the scene like an archaeological dig, sifting through the earth for stray bullets, jewelry, or other identification with deliberate precision. The initial search of the construction site turned up no clues to tell investigators the identity of the victim. After several hours, the badly decomposed body, wrapped in garbage bags, was hand-dug from the grave. Despite their continued efforts, no additional evidence or identification was found. Police needed to know who was in the grave before they could figure out how he or she got there. For help, investigators called on distinguished anthropology professor Dr. Owen Lovejoy at Kent State University. I went out and uh, examined the body and collected some materials, uh, the purpose of which was to provide as many details about that individual in life as I could. From the condition of the pelvis, Examiners were able to determine that the body was a female somewhere around 28 to 30 years old. An examination into the shape and proportions of the skull told them that the victim was Caucasian. Dr. Lovejoy measured the thigh and arm bones and factored them into an equation to determine the victim's height. She was surprisingly tall, almost six feet. 
Dr. Lovejoy had provided investigators with their first glimpse of how the victim appeared alive. It was now up to them to discover her identity. Detectives started by looking into unsolved missing persons cases. But in all of those cases, none of the missing women fit the description of the buried body. Investigators turned their attention to the only other piece of evidence. Though it seemed like a long shot, they called in a draftsman to measure the fractured pieces of the makeshift coffin and render a detailed illustration of it. Investigators turned the illustration over to the local paper, along with the description of the unidentified woman. Days later, a woman called to say that she thought she recognized the makeshift coffin. The woman remembered admiring the piece in her friend Sandra Stuller's apartment. She told police it had been over three years since Sandra disappeared without a goodbye. She wasn't able to offer any speculation on what happened to her old friend, but she was able to give police a valuable piece of information. Like the woman found at the construction site, Sandra Stuller was six feet tall. Though still unsure that they'd identified their victim, it was the investigator's only lead. Detectives tracked down an aunt and uncle of Sandra's living in the area. Like the witness who identified the chest, they hadn't seen their niece in the past three years. The relatives said that shortly before they lost touch, Sandra had rekindled a relationship with her ex-husband, Doug Hartman. He had been a loving and supportive oh, husband at first, so but as the years went by, he grew abusive. Sandra eventually left him, but Doug wanted her back, and against the wishes of her relatives, she decided to give him another chance. And the family told Sandra, this is a bad move. You should not go back to Douglas Hartman. In fact, if you decide to do that, you're no longer part of this family. But Sandra so stuck like with Doug and the family yeah, severed so. ties. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. If you hear from her, they hadn't heard from her since. Now, investigators needed to pick up the story where the aunt and uncle's account left off. They tracked down the manager of Sandra's last known apartment, where she lived just before she disappeared in 1987. She had paid rent in full. But Apparently, the reunion with Doug had been short-lived. Sandra had been living alone at the time. And she wasn't there. The manager remembered that the circumstances surrounding Sandra's departure were strange. In December of 1987, she saw a man moving Sandra's belongings out of the apartment and into a rental truck. The manager had not seen the man before. She didn't see Sandra that day or ever again. Sandra had abandoned her apartment without a word. Investigators suspected the man moving Sandra's things was Doug Hartman. To prove that theory, they went to the truck rental agency. They poured over hundreds of receipts from three years before. On one of the receipts from December of 1987, they found what they came for. Do you happen to remember anything about this gentleman? The name of Sandra's ex-husband, Doug Hartman. Okay. I appreciate it. It was time to question Doug. 
but there was no record of him living in town. But detectives managed to find a relative still in the area. He told police he hadn't heard from Doug since he had gone to live with his grandmother in Fredericksburg, Virginia, a few years back. Detectives wondered what had prompted Doug to leave town. And if you hear from him or think of anything else. But their theories would be meaningless until they could prove that the buried remains belonged to Sandra Stuller. Detectives in Elyria, Ohio, believe that the body and the makeshift coffin unearthed at a construction site belonged to Sandra Stuller. And they suspected that her ex-husband, Doug Hartman, had put her there. Word of the investigation into Sandra Stuller's whereabouts spread quickly. A local bank manager contacted detectives. He, too, had been searching for Sandra. She had stopped paying rent on a security deposit box. Investigators obtained a search warrant. The contents of the box included Sandra's divorce decree, her will, and some diamond and gold jewelry not the kind of valuable items a person would carelessly abandon, unless, as Detective Dan Jekyll thought, they had no choice. And that reinforced my idea that the person that we uncovered on Shadden Road was in fact Sandra Stuller, but I had to prove it. Detectives were running out of ways to accomplish that goal. Desperate for any information, they plugged Sandra's social security number into a law enforcement database. They got a hit. Sandra had been in a car accident shortly before she disappeared. The report mentioned that she had been taken to the hospital for treatment, which included x-rays. It was the break detectives were looking for. When I found out that there was a chest x-ray taken, I knew that this would help the case. And when I contacted Dr. Lovejoy, he told me, if I can get that original x-ray, there's a real good chance that he can identify the remains. Investigators visited the hospital and subpoenaed Sandra Stuller's x-rays. Now that they had a source of comparison, they turned back to the expertise of forensic anthropologist, Dr. Owen Lovejoy. Initially, when we looked at her skeleton and compared it to these chest films, we realized that there were a number of very special characters that were very rare. One of these was the fact that she only had 11 ribs when a normal individual usually has 12. That's a fairly rare um, abnormality. Another is that the individual had suffered a fracture of her right clavicle. And so these were two characters that matched both the bones that we had. It was powerful evidence, but not conclusive. Lovejoy next had to examine the very fine details preserved inside the bone. There, small features called trabecula are as unique as the characteristics of a fingerprint. To make the comparison, Dr. Lovejoy began by re-X-raying the bones with a powerful machine called a faxitron that produces high-resolution images of bone. That completed, he then compared the trabecula one by one. We did this in this particular case and found that they were in fact an exact match so that there was no question that these were the remains of Sandra Stuller. The victim had finally been identified. Investigators now needed to establish and prove motive in her death. Looking through her financial records, they believed they found their answer. Prior to her disappearance, Sandra had inherited over $100,000 when her mother died. 
she had set up a $50,000 mutual fund and had been living off the interest. But a letter in the file, signed by Sandra after she had already been murdered, requested that her assets be transferred to an account in Fredericksburg, Virginia. That account was in the name of Doug Hartman. Sandra Stuller had been murdered for her money. And through bank records and subpoenas, I was able to track that $51,000 into Douglas Hartman's own personal checking account. I did have a motive then. Doug was brought back to Ohio for questioning. When investigators confronted him with all of the evidence, he began to crumble. He confessed to killing her, but claimed that it had been an accident. Police believed otherwise. After murdering Sandra and burying her body, Doug fled to Virginia, where he had all of her assets transferred into his bank account. It took a jury less than six hours to find Doug Hartman guilty of aggravated murder, tampering with evidence, abuse of a corpse, and theft. He was sentenced to life in prison. Though Sandra Stuller's body had been buried for more than three years, investigators were able to solve her murder from the bare bones. In Illinois, investigators had even less to work with. Stretching from Chicago to Springfield, I-55 is one of the most heavily traveled highways in Illinois. State troopers regularly cruise its length, hunting down speeders. But on March 10th, 1986, it was not a speeder that caught the troopers' attention. Something was burning on the side of the road. As the officer approached, he thought it was a mannequin that had been set on fire. But as he got closer, he realized it was something far more disturbing. It was the charred mass of a human body. After extinguishing the blaze, the trooper called for backup. The following morning, evidence technicians from the Illinois Division of Criminal Investigations began processing the area for clues. The scene offered little indication as to who could have committed this brutal act. The only potential evidence was a set of tire tracks imprinted in the soil. But on a well-traveled highway, they could have belonged to anyone. Technicians made a plaster mold of the tread marks in the hopes a suspect would emerge and could then be placed at the scene. But finding a suspect would be difficult, if not impossible, until detectives could identify the remains. At autopsy, the examiner concluded the female victim had died from blunt force trauma to the head. The only identifying features that survived the fire were her teeth. A pearl necklace and a ring bearing the letter E were removed from the victim. Based on her petite stature and slender hip dimensions, the examiner believed the victim to be between 18 and 25 years old and possibly Hispanic. For Lieutenant Carlos Hevia of the Illinois Department of Criminal Investigations, the information wasn't a lot to go on. The first order of business is to identify who's the victim. 
in this particular case, we had difficulty because of the fact that we, we didn't have a photograph to go around when we were doing canvassing. Nonetheless, investigators began questioning people in the neighborhoods around the scene of the fire. One clerk at a nearby gas station remembered selling a can of gasoline the night before. He helped investigators come up with a composite. The sketch was publicized, but no one came forward to name the suspect. Investigators launched a statewide media campaign. A flood of tips came in, but after two weeks, detectives still couldn't match the remains to any missing persons cases. With their whole case hinging on identification, investigators sought help from the state's forensic anthropology department. After taking a life-sized x-ray of the victim's skull, they built a three-dimensional model sculpting a face in modeling clay. It might not be an identical match, but hopefully it would bring about a spark of recognition from the public. Photographs of the reconstructed head and the victim's ring were sent to local press. But again, no one came forward to identify the young woman. Now, several weeks after the murder, chances of solving the case were dwindling away. A methodical killer still walked the streets. After several weeks, investigators were no closer to solving the brutal murder of an unidentified woman whose body had been set on fire and left burning on the side of an Illinois highway. Desperate to identify the remains, investigators sent the victim's skull and teeth to Dr. Stephen Smith, a consultant in forensic dentistry. In the worst of circumstances, the teeth pretty well survive. And so because of that, uh, we become very uh, useful for uh, the uniqueness of the, the human dentition. We can find the uniquenesses that everybody has in their dentition. And that's enough to separate us from one human being to another. The arch of the jaw suggested that the victim was most likely Asian, not Hispanic. After studying the general anatomy, Dr. Smith examined each individual tooth. This would be the uh, temporary cement that would indicate that this person is uh, probably going to be going back to the dentist. And uh, I see some bone loss in this area. Uh, this would indicate periodontal disease and uh, that the person probably was uh, possibly seeing a periodontist. This kind of dental history gave Dr. Smith new insight into the victim's age. As I looked at this information and uh, as, as I came to my uh, independent evaluation, I, I thought this person had to be at least in their 40s. Uh, at 38 to, to 40, maybe 42, 43, somewhere like that, but not more than a five-year uh, difference. Dr. Smith's detailed analysis had exposed a critical flaw in the original description of the victim. She couldn't have been between the ages of 18 and 25, as previously thought. He showed that she was some 20 years older than that. In this particular case, we were scrambling because we were chasing an 18 to 25 year old missing person that was not our victim. So when they came up with that, it was like somebody just opened a, a door, you know. Now, almost two months after the burning body had been found, detectives went back to the statewide police computer network and modified the victim's description. The new findings paid off. Within hours of modifying their search, investigators received a call from nearby DuPage County Sheriff's Department. 
they had a missing persons case that matched the new description. Illinois State Police met with DuPage County sheriffs to discuss the case. They learned Erlinda Anderson was a 43-year-old housewife reported missing by her sister in early March. Born in the Philippines, she'd come to the United States to marry her husband, William. The fact that this victim's name began with the letter E led investigators to believe they were on the right track. Deputies told investigators that they had met with William Anderson shortly after his wife was reported missing. He was questioned about his wife and their marriage. It hadn't been a traditional courtship. During the interview, Anderson admitted that he'd met Erlinda through a classified ad. She was looking for an American husband. He was looking for companionship. The relationship started well, Anderson said. She seemed very happy with the comforts of middle-class America. But as the marriage wore on, Erlinda became very homesick. He insisted Erlinda wasn't missing. In fact, he'd seen her board a plane bound for the Philippines in early March. Following up on William Anderson's story, DuPage County investigators questioned Erlinda's friends. They confirmed that Erlinda had been unhappy with her life in the U.S., mostly because of her marriage to William. And she had been longing to return home. But it was strange that they hadn't heard from their friend in months. William Anderson's inconsistent story, coupled with Dr. Smith's forensic analysis, led investigators to now believe the victim found burning on the side of the road was Erlinda Anderson. And that would make her husband the leading suspect in her murder. But so far, there was no evidence to prove it. Investigators from the Illinois Department of Criminal Investigations were getting closer to identifying charred remains found along a highway. They believed the victim was 43-year-old Erlinda Anderson. But until they could be sure, police wouldn't be able to make a case against the prime suspect, her husband, William. With only the victim's teeth to work with, investigators subpoenaed Erlinda's dental records. Right. They were sent to forensic dentist, Dr. Stephen Smith, for comparison. While awaiting the results of his examination, detectives began scrutinizing William Anderson's alibi. He had claimed that he had seen Erlinda board a plane bound for the Philippines. Investigators paid a visit to the airlines. Anderson had in fact purchased a ticket to Manila in Erlinda's name. But a week before her body was found, records showed that William Anderson cashed in the ticket. Linda never boarded a plane to the Philippines. William Anderson had been caught in a blatant lie. But if Anderson had killed his wife, the question now before investigators was why? A further background check revealed that Erlinda had been William's fifth wife. Based on a search of Anderson's phone records, they learned that he probably didn't intend her to be his last. 
Many of the bills reflected calls to one of Anderson's female co-workers. The woman, who was married, reluctantly admitted that she and Anderson had been having an affair. Anderson complained to her that Erlinda was constantly spending his money, always sending gifts to her friends and family in the Philippines. The day after the body was found, William took her out for a romantic dinner. He told her to leave her husband and marry him instead. She questioned Anderson about, well, you know, what about your wife? And uh, uh, Anderson told her, don't worry about my wife, she's not coming back. The case was now in the hands of forensic dentist, Dr. Stephen Smith. When making an identification, Smith superimposes the living dental records with the x-rays made after death. On this case here, I can take and move it around and all of a sudden I see a clear picture. It was fuzzy, now it's totally clear. It means that the one film overlays the other one perfectly. Uh, in myself, if I'm asked, uh, uh, is this a match, I, I could say yes. I would be assured, looking at this film, that this film matches that film, and I could say that this uh, dentition belongs to that uh, remains. After months of frustration, the burned body had finally been identified as Erlinda Anderson. And with a new romance brewing, William Anderson had motive to get rid of her. Still lacking physical evidence linking him to the murder, investigators paid him another visit. They asked him to follow them to the police station for further questioning. While police began their interrogation, a warrant was obtained to search Anderson's car. Though the tire treads did not match those found at the crime scene, the trunk and the items inside it were splattered with red stains. Indicator tests confirmed the presence of human blood on a windbreaker and a tire iron. The blood was too deteriorated to make a detailed comparison, but it was one more piece of incriminating evidence. The results of the examination were brought up to police. William Anderson was placed under arrest. Investigators believe that Anderson used the tire iron to beat Erlinda in the head. After she was dead, he drove her body down Interstate 55. He doused her body in gasoline thinking that all his problems would burn away in the ensuing fire. Without the insights of forensic dentistry, he might have gotten away without a trace. A jury found William Anderson guilty of murder and sentenced him to life in prison. Some killers are determined to keep the identity of their victims a secret. When they are successful, their deeds threaten to go unpunished. But forensic scientists can breathe life into a dying investigation and find justice written in bone.